Então, pessoal, bom dia. É um prazer recebê-los nesta, nesta auditório para conhecer o professor Frank Malver. O professor Frank Malver, ele é hoje diretor de pesquisa, né, vice-diretor de pesquisa da Universidade de, de Calgary. Ele vai conversar um pouquinho com a gente a respeito da integração de indústria com a universidade. A experiência do Frank é muito baseada na parte de desenvolvimento ágil, na parte de desenvolvimento de produtos, de UX, para quem gosta dessa parte aí, user, user experience. É, Frank vai ficar com a gente mais ou menos uma hora. Eu passo a palavra para o Frank. Por beleza. Thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, my name is Frank Maurer. I'm a professor of computer science at the University of Calgary. I'm also currently serving as a special advisor on entrepreneurship and innovation at the University of Calgary. And today I'm actually talking about both aspects a little bit. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the joys and the challenges of research projects with industry partners and what I've learned over the last 20 years. And I actually want to start my talk by really going back about a thousand years. Um, a thousand years ago, about a thousand years ago, the first universities were created in Europe. You see the University of Bologna, uh, which was the first official uh, university in the world. At least that's one of the universities that gave that title. Um, and even at the very start of universities, universities were coming out of medieval uh, cathedral schools, um, even at the start there were actually two approaches of universities. On the one hand, universities were self-regulating and independent corporations of scholars. So students and teachers working together to enhance uh, teaching. And it was really a very strong integration between the students and the teacher. On the other hand, universities were founded by royal or imperial charter to serve the needs of government. Two, two completely different approaches. On the one hand, people coming together in a room and teach and learn. On the other hand, people being, uh, being funded by government to solve real world problems. And that, um, that force in between, we still see today, nearly a thousand years later. And in fact, originally universities were teaching institutions. In fact, they were not looking at new stuff, they, are, they, are, they were looking at rediscovering the old Greek, Greek and Roman knowledge that was lost in, after the, the fall of the Roman Empire, and they brought it back into society uh, in teaching institutions. So, in the end, really, um, they started to train students to become clerics, lawyers, physicians, civil servants, so people that needed to, to eat and write, which was not that common in that time. And then only later they actually moved on towards knowledge for the sake of knowledge. Stay. So where universities really were trying to acquire and maintain uh, knowledge just because it's knowledge. And only a few hundred years later, uh, scholarly journals were created to spread the innovations among the learners. So journals are really about spreading knowledge around. And even uh, a few hundred years later after that, we really moved from preservation and transmission of accepted knowledge to new discovery. And this is actually the origin of the research universities that are widespread nowadays in, in the world, and which is our model of universities. In fact, when you look at what is the definition of a professor? A professor is a scholarly teacher and researcher in post-secondary education. I took that off. Wikipedia, and yes, I know some people don't like Wikipedia as a source, but this is an, the, the common accepted definition of uh, what a professor is most in, uh, in most parts of the, of the world. A teacher and a researcher in the same person. Having said that, uh, whenever I had a party, people ask me what I'm doing. Uh, I'm doing, uh, and I tell them I'm a professor at the university, that don't ask me about research. Talk, uh, they ask me, what do you teach? So the perception of the public is professors are teachers, while the perception of the professors are we are researchers first and teachers second. So there, there is this ambiguity. So teaching and, and research are seen as integral part of all modern uh, universities. And when you look at the big name universities, MIT, Stanford, Harvard, and the US, Oxford, Cambridge, and other universities across the world, really the, uh, 
the, they embed the, uh, the idea of teaching and research uh, as a combination in, in their mandates and in, in what they actually do. And on the other hand, what we also see is we are becoming a more and more educated society. More and more people are going into tertiary, post-secondary education and are getting university level degree, uh, degrees after high school. In fact, uh, there's a common trend uh, across the world. I pulled this data from the OECD website. And basically, when what you see over the last 15 years is a substantial upward trend in people attending university in, in the normal university age. So you, you see Canada quite high. You see the OECD average. The city is a little bit lower. However, you also see a very strong trend. And because it's a low, uh, low starting point, basically, this is the strongest percentage increase. It's basically doubling the student population. We see this trend. We are becoming more and more knowledge-based societies where universities are really seen as central to, for the survival of high-income jobs in societies. So the question is now, what's the impact of that enrollment growth? How can we actually deal with more and more students at, as a university? The first option is we simply increase overall spending. We keep the, the money that we put into each student the same, and we simply increase the budgets of universities. Nice idea. Not very realistic. Alternative, we lower the cost that we spend per student. Um, we can do this by increasing class sizes, in the end impacting the quality of the education. Instead of sitting in a class of 20 or 30, you would be sitting in class of 300, 400, 800 uh, students. We can also save, try to save money on other parts. We can defer maintenance. We have old and crappy labs and classrooms. We have buildings that are, that are not uh, being cared, cared for simply because we want to put more money into the educational part and the infrastructure is secondary. There is obviously a limit on how far this can go. But in the end, we are, um, we, we, we are reducing costs by lowering some kind of quality in the university system. That's one way. We could try to look into other ways to teach. A very big buzzword nowadays is MOOCs, massively open online courses, where universities like Stanford or others are offering students uh, club classes to students that have a, an enrollment of 100,000 students per class. So 300, 400 suddenly in a classroom sounds really small compared to 100,000 students enrolled in, in a single course taught by a single instructor. Um, other ways, we simply drop the, the non-teaching mandates. We can say professors are becoming teachers and that's their only job. Research is not an important part. Or instead of doing this as a whole for all universities, we can actually do this also um, that we have specialized universities. Some universities that are only teaching, others that are teaching and, and doing research, and others that are primarily focused on research. We see that kind of specialization across the world. I just talked with a few people here since I arrived in Brazil, and the, the public universities here in Brazil apparently are teaching only universities. This is right. Another public, the, the private universities. Good. So, or we find other ways to actually find money. So that actually also raises the question: Who actually pays for the education? Who pays? There are a couple of different approaches across the world that we see. One is society pays, uh, meaning the government puts the bill for the uh, for the education, public education. Um, and makes it cheap or free for the student populations. This is pretty much the approach that most of Europe is following. Um, what's the impact on society? We either have to increase taxes because we have more students, <coughs> meaning more expenses, meaning we need more money, increase taxes. We could also decide we, are not, we don't want to raise taxes. It's not very popular in most places of the world to, to pay higher taxes. So we keep the taxes the same, but universities are important, so we reduce other uh, 
a service that the government is providing. Less roads, less policemen, less doctors that are being paid by the government. How we increase debt? Student uh, government CP are taking on debt and, um, and use it to invest into the future by educating their population. The other point is society doesn't pay, um, the student pays, which typically means the student family will pay. Uh, that's actually the approach that a lot of uh, the US universities are following. When you look at the cost of education in some of the top universities in, uh, in the US, like MIT or Stanford, you can easily get 60,000 US dollars per year in cost for university undergraduate. $45,000 is about tuition, and $15,000 is, uh, is the cost of living. But that's, what does this mean? Either the student comes from a rich family, they simply pay. The student comes from a poor per family and ends up with a lot of debt, or something in between. I also should point out that, yes, these costs are extremely high, but there are lots of options to actually get some deductive or some, some funding from the university. But in the end, this is reducing access. We will always be able to find money for the top students, for the best of the best, the brightest of the brightest, and support them in their education. But by definition, 50% of all students are below average. Why? Because that's how the average is defined. So how, how do we deal with the average student that will have a great career, but is not the next Nobel Prize winner? And we see a trend that uh, in North America that people from less wealthy families are getting less educated. Well, the third option is obviously, and that's what we as professors really don't like, is we can actually make faculty pay. We can lower the income of professors. We can hire sessionals, which are professors that are only paid when they teach, and they are unemployed when they are not teaching. Uh, substantially lower than a normal professor. We can increase the teaching load, which in the end actually would mean we either are giving up um, family time, or we are giving up research, or we are giving something else up. Higher teaching load in, in the end means something else has to go. We can change the mandate for professors. You are not supposed to, to do research anymore. You are basically becoming an advanced high, high school teacher. Or, last option is, we can try to sell research skills going back to how do we increase revenue for the universities? Where's the money coming from? And in fact, that is an approach uh, that is being pursued. However, it's not the same as the traditional idea of knowledge for the knowledge scene, where we do blue sky research, coming up with ideas, great ideas uh, that might actually change uh, the world as we know. And the, the, traditional, the traditional idea of, a, of research at the university really is, I pursue my interest, my curiosity. I want to discover new things, and I don't care if they actually have an application. And that was an approach that was quite successful. When you look at um, electromagnetism studies uh, done by Hertz and Maxwell in the I think 19th century, leading to radios and radio communication, which is this is a little bit an outdated model, but it has actually an impact on the world. Or another alternative is the research that created the laser. It was completely blue sky, discovery-driven research, knowledge for the knowledge's sake, and is uh, fundamental nowadays for all kinds of IT technologies. Um, you know, now at a little bit outdated DVDs and CDs are one of the examples. So that kind of blue sky research was a traditional approach of research in universities. And what I'm arguing today for is actually problem-driven research. So when you look at the discovery-driven research, the idea really is the researcher with his or her curiosity comes up with an idea and then looks for a problem where the idea can actually be a solution. So we are pushing things out into, into the field. Come up with an idea and then look for where it actually is applicable. Problem-driven research is really about turning that error around. Start with real world problems, by the way, this is a picture of downtown Calgary during the flood that we had in 2013. So the water is not supposed to be there. 
So we start with real world problems and we then use the brain power that exi exists on our university campus to actually address these, uh, these problems. And there's a lot of uh, brain power on campuses. Uh, the University of Calgary, for example, has about 1,700 professors and about 6,500 graduate students. All of them typically very selected and bright people. And all of them, or most of them, actually are heavily engaged with some kind of research activities. And I'm sure the 40,000 students here on campus uh, you have similar numbers uh, for sure. So why problem-driven research? First of all, it's really about helping to solve real-world problems. Instead of coming up with something and then looking for a problem, often it's easier to start from the problem and then develop the techniques, methods, and technologies that actually allow you to address this problem. The other thing is, when you actually look at the North American PhD, uh, the PhD programs, only 20% of all our graduates actually will go to academic jobs after they graduate. What does this mean? 80% will end up somewhere. They will end up in industry, they will, they will end up in government organizations, they will end up in not-for-profit organizations. 80% of our PhD students are not becoming academics. The problem is we are, we are training 100% of them to become academics. So let's think about ways how we can actually enhance and improve our PhD program so that they have, get more transferable, more practical skills and problem-driven research would embed them or does embed them directly into solving real world problems where somebody would pay for the solution. The other thing is problem-driven research is actually also something that lines up quite nicely with the understanding that profs have on research. We often get into research because we are curious, because we like to learn new things and understand new things. And graduate students the same. Graduate student is not a high, high income profession. Being a graduate student is you're still a student. You're not earning a normal income. So as a graduate student, you do this because you are dedicated to uh, to the work and to the, uh, the research that you want. And you, are, you want to learn something new. So when you actually uh, look at what that actually means, when you think about all of human knowledge as this big circle, you do elementary school, you get a part of this. You do high school, you get a little bit more. When you start at university with an undergraduate degree, you get a little bit more, more knowledge and then a bit of specialization in a certain field, computer science, engineering, chemistry, social science, whatever. You get a little bit of depth. Then you move on to a master's program. You're getting much more depth um, in that specific field. But you're also getting narrower and narrower. And then when you do a PhD, you basically are ending up at the edge of human knowledge. You really are an expert in a field and you are actually at the border between what we know and what we don't know. And then you actually go a little bit beyond that, and that's to be a PhD thesis. So you are expanding on a certain aspect of human knowledge and you're adding something that wasn't known before. That's, by the way, that's not my graphics, that's, I stole that from the internet. And when you do problem-driven research, you do not know if this is the right area. Because when you start with the problem, you typically would also have to look at other areas. So problem driven research often requires you to learn about other areas, which actually lines up quite well with the self-picture that we have of researchers wanting to, to learn more stuff. So you learn a few more areas, at some you learn a little, at some you go to the edge, at some you might actually go beyond there. Okay, I also want to, so problem-driven research is really about solving real-world problems, but there are two ways, two, two stages in that process. One is we solve the problem in the lab, the other is we solve the problem in real life. And we distinguish in the innovation literature between inventions that are the first occurrence of an idea or new process uh, or product, but innovation is actually the application of an invention in practice. So invention, invention can happen in a lab. Ideas can also come up, 
outside of the lab. But innovations can happen in university lab. Innovations <laughs> always have to ha happen outside of lab because it's really moving it into practice. So, what are the steps in problem-driven research? First, we need to identify, as a researcher, you need to identify your research. What are you good at? Uh, if you're not good at something, nobody really cares about talking to you. You need to be good at something, and you need to know what this is. You need to have a conversation opener with, outside, with potential outside partners. You need to do a lot of networking to find the partner organizations. You need to identify the research challenge with that partner organization. Obviously, you, should, you need to find out what is the state of the art, because you don't want to reinvent the wheel, you want to do something new. You have to do the research and find the solution, and then you actually need to transfer it into practice. And I want to point out that this is not a linear process. You're going back and forth between these stages all the time. So, I am now going to use myself as, an, as a case study of what this act is. What, I, what I'm, I good at. My students and I um, are really looking overall on the theme, how to develop innovative software systems effectively and efficiently. And that's where we did actually quite a bit of the agile methods research. We follow a problem approach, we follow an application-focused approach, and we typically work with some outside partner organizations uh, in identifying research problems before we actually start working on them. As a result, um, I, we changed our research focus quite a bit. I actually did my PhD in Germany, probably everybody has stressed that by now that that accent is not uh, from North America, yeah, I'm from Germany. So I did actually uh, um, a PhD in AI, looking knowledge-based system, machine learning, case-based reasoning, non-modern atomic reason, knowledge engineering. I then applied techniques and knowledge that I learned here to support both software engineering process modeling and software uh, workflow <coughs> management. And we uh, were involved in projects on that. However, I learned more and more about software engineering in that process, and the teachings from the textbooks I thought are incredibly wrong at that point in time, um, because they basically describe software development as a linear process. Requirements and analysis, design, implementation, testing, delivery. It doesn't work that way in practice. So when the agile methods became uh, popularized in industry in the late 90s, I started to actually look at them as an alternative to actually conduct this, uh, to actually develop software. And we did quite a bit of work on test driven development, Agile UX. I think you mentioned that in the introduction. Um, and we also did quite a bit of work on Agile project management. Think about it was 1999, 2000, uh, the XP book, the Scrum book just came out. And we said, okay, it's nice that you develop software effectively in a team that sits together, but sometimes the teams are not sitting together. So we started looking at how can we actually manage teams following an agile process while being distributed. And we developed very early prototypes of um, task management, story management tools. And in fact, one of the tools that we developed used a digital table um, to actually support agile planning. Why did we start looking into a digital table? Um, we observed how agile teams that were co-located did the work. They sat around the table, created index cards, and moved them around, clustered them, and did the iteration and release planning that way. So, the obvious choice is now we want to have distributed planning meetings. You cannot look at the index cards directly, so let's put them onto an electronic display and as the use tables. Let's use a digital table. Having said that, that is a custom designed table. Um, at that time, we didn't have that kind of technology. In fact, at that time, uh, things like the iPhone didn't even exist. That was way really before that time. So, as a result of looking into digital table, we actually became interested in application engineering for digital services. How do you build applications that utilize touch and non-touch technologies for interacting with data in a 
co-located and distributed environment. And think about a digital service of anything from a smartphone over a tablet to a digital table to wall-sized displays. And how do you integrate these technologies into an effective uh, end, to end solutions? And I was actually running a national research network on that topic for the last six years, just finished end of September, where we had a group of about 12 profs across Canada, 60 graduate students on at any given point in time, really looking into application-oriented uh, research on digital services. And now we start to look more and more into big data issues. How do you engineer big data applications? Why? Because uh, some of the applications that we developed here actually pointed us that we need that to actually solve the real world problem that needs to be addressed. So, in fact, our research is also partially driven by what we learn of what's needed uh, from our uh, partners. So, what's our con conversation with now? You need something cool. So the, the nice thing about digital table at that time, it was really cool. So the opener is really, that's a picture from the movie Avatar. Uh, you see holographic displays, you see big displays, um, you see people collaborating around large amounts of data. You also know this is how it was actually filmed. Anything, the difference between this picture and that picture is com computer generated graphics. It's all CG. What we really want to do is get closer to that picture, uh, but not in CG, in the CG sense, but in real. So we are doing quite a bit of work on that kind of, of uh, technology. So now you, you have your partner, you start talking to them, um, they listen to you because you have something cool to show, um, you have a conversation going. And in the end, what you really need to do is you need to nurture a collaboration pipeline. Uh, you have a lot of prospects, potential partners. Then you have a very short conversation um, based on a conversation starter to determine is there any way to actually start a real collaboration. So then I would suggest start a real collaboration that is short term. Because unless you really work with an outside partner, you do not know if their understanding of collaboration is your understanding of it actually match. And it's uh, really, really a lot of suffering if you are actually in a collaboration with a partner that doesn't really line up with your thinking and you have to continue the collaboration for the next three years. So something short, hopefully uh, leading to something long. And in fact, uh, on the side, uh, you probably will have to develop a search proposal to actually get funding for the program. So, first of all, networking is very time consuming. You need to talk to dozens and dozens of people uh, to go from here to here to here. And the success rate is relatively low. You can talk to 100 people and uh, might end up with one or two uh, real projects that are long term collaborations. The problem, or the issue really is you need to talk about what is their problem. What is what, not what is your solution. You need to, the conversations have to center around what their problems are. And as soon as you understand what their problems are, you need to make a decision, a judgment call. Are you the right partner? If not, find somebody of your colleagues. You have a thousand or more people on campus that are really bright. There might, there is probably somebody that actually can uh, talk about their problems effectively and efficiently. And then the last question is, who will actually fund the research? Who will actually pay for doing uh, the research? Because research is not free. A couple of remarks on about mandates, misunderstandings, and incentives. So there is quite a difference between incentives and the structure of academia and the structure um, in industry. Our mandate in academia is really about research and teaching. In this case, about great wealth in the end, and it's about making money. We are, as profs, are evaluated mostly by the publishing paradigm. How many papers do we get out in high quality journals and conferences? Uh, they don't care about publications, they care about delivering solutions. 
we think, we know of the tenure is independent. Nobody can tell me what I have to do. Um, the president of the university cannot tell me what I have to do. I decide myself. This is quite the opposite uh, of an industry structure where the boss of the company can actually order your run. <laughs> And they think that a prof works for the university, so they think when they talk to a senior person, they can tell their employees what to do, not really the case. In fact, this is really routed in the, the thousand year traditions of uh, profs and students seeing themselves as a collaboration of scholars, independence. For us graduate students is the key personality. Practically speaking, computer science research is done by graduate students. It's, we can advise them uh, as professors, but in the end, most of the, the work, specifically the implementation work, is done by graduate students. While student training is a very low priority for the industry, they want to have people that actually have the skills instead of helping the people to acquire the skills. We want research for insight. They simply want to deliver product. Our payment, at least in North America, is linked to publication and teaching. For them, research is not on the critical path and can never be on the critical path. If you have to conduct research to deliver a product in a year, by definition, you do not know if research outcomes will actually fall in place uh, as quickly and as, uh, uh, as positively as you would hope. So you are trying to avoid putting research endeavors on the critical path. Development? Yes. Real research, much more limited. On the other hand, we see governments, at least in North America and Europe, pushing towards innovation. Um, they want us to, act, they want universities to actually have an impact um, in the real world that goes beyond delivering students highly qualified personnel uh, as worker bees to companies. Industry, on the other hand, is development focus, and very often time is the more limited research, not the money. There are two very common misunderstandings that you need to uh, determine from the start. Collaboration does not mean for prof, give me money for whatever I am doing anyway. If you think that's the approach, it, it will be very hard to find a collaboration part. On the other hand, you also need to be aware as a prof that uh, some industry partners think I pay you for the collaboration so you work, you and your students work for me. This is not the way how university research uh, can be conducted. Our timelines are based on academic schedules. I'm getting the next batch of graduate students in, in September 2016. Even if I talk to a company today, there's no way that I can get a new PhD student before that. On the other hand, industry often wants short timelines. They are, they are based on quarterly results, so impact needs to be a very, very short. Uh, I need to make commitments to students for two to four years, the length of a master's or PhD degree. Long commitments are really difficult for an industry partner, and the smaller and the newer the industry partner is, the harder it is to make long. Okay, moving on, next step. How do you determine the state of the art? You basically start with the problem, then you need to determine what is the actual research topic. Um, you need to uh, determine that this research topic is actually in your, or close to your area of expertise. You cannot find a partner. Then what is the state of the art? And then uh, to answer that question, you need to conduct a literature survey. There's a lot of things being published. How do we do a literature survey? Best case, your team already knows the state of the art in the area. That's perfect because then you're done. If not, you can find an expert in the area and work with them, or you can do your own literature survey. How do you know that you can stop with the literature survey? That's actually a tricky question. How do you know that you actually know what state of the art is when you're not the expert? What we currently do we follow a, a process that is called a systematic review or systematic mapping. And we are using the power of information technology, specifically search engines, to actually help us determine the state of the art. And it all boils down to we develop queries 
that we then submit to the search engine, resulting in a list of papers that we have to read. If we only read the abstracts, the study is called a systematic mapping study, and there are papers that describe the process. If we read the whole paper, it's a systematic review. The problem is that this query is unlikely to generate the right list. So probably you learn something about this list and you have to go back and change the, the query so that you can actually update it. The good thing about the query is it's repeatable. So as soon as you have a good query about a research area, you can run it again two years later and see what has changed. How do we determine if that's the right list? We basically look into precision and recall from uh, metrics from information. So when you look at everything that's out there, and these are the results of your, your query. You have two positives. These are the papers that are really relevant, and you have false positives. These are the papers that were retrieved, but are not relevant. And then you have false negatives. These are the papers that you should have found, but you haven't. And the tricky part is really this area. This area. There's something out there that you should have found, but you haven't. So precision is basically the ratio between the two positives and everything that you've received. So how much garbage are you getting in your results? And the call is actually the ratio between uh, the two positives and everything that you should have found. Precision is actually relatively straightforward to deal with. Uh, you will look at how many false positives you are getting. If you, are, if you have too many, you will find the query in a way so that you're getting rid of the false positive. And the only thing what you have to make sure is that the new query is not using the true positive. So that's pretty straightforward. A little bit more tricky is actually dealing with the recall. The problem really is you do not know what's the relevant uh, set of papers. You do not know how big that set is. So how do you actually get that? You can ask an expert if something is missing. You can manually look at relevant conference and journal and see if you, something has missing. Or you can actually again use a systematic query to actually um, improve the, the quality of your list of papers. And or each of these papers has a list of references. You look at all of these and you'll find some um, in there that are not relevant, two ones. You find some that are relevant but already in your list, so good. And you find some that are relevant but not in your list. And this is looking backwards in time because anything that you find in these governments is older than the paper itself. You also want to look forward in time and you can use search engines to find which papers are referring that paper that you identify as relevant. And then we do the same thing. King is something okay, you already have it, that is something missing. And the important aspect is actually every time you find the red box, you update your query. And that gives you better and better queries for your research area. There are a couple of limitations of this approach. First of all, systematic mapping is severely limited by the quality of the abstracts. Unfortunately, computer science, a lot of our abstracts are written with the wrong information. In them. Authors simply screw up writing the abstract. It's not, they write it as a motivation. They don't tell you what's actually uh, in the paper. And the problem with that is obviously if you don't, you know, if the abstract is wrong, it's garbage in, garbage out. So in the end, the systematic mapping is really about determining what are key topics, how does the area develop over time, what are the primary research groups in, in a field, uh, and then you could actually look uh, for their papers and see if there's something new. Systematic mapping, on the other hand, are more accurate because <coughs> what's in the paper is really in the paper. So you're not missing information, while the air abstract might be missing information. The problem is reading a lot of papers is time consuming. Uh, and we all live in physical time, so, uh, and we all want to finish the research work, we have deadlines to meet, we have publications to write, we have theses to write, so we cannot spend five years just writing, uh, reading papers. So in the end, if the, your, your, the, the final list that you have is a thousand papers, you cannot read all of them. What does it mean? You need to reduce the scope of your original uh, research and actually narrow the, the research question 
and then we can actually follow the same process. Then you need to conduct the research. A lot of the work that we've done lately really was about spatial awareness. Can we create infrastructure so that the system knows where people and devices are in the room? And we use that spatial awareness to really um, interact with information on, on devices. And there are two approaches. We can either instrument the room with sensors to actually get that spatial information, or we instrument the devices and the people. And to give you an idea how this would look like, so here we are actually interacting with information on the digital table uh, by simply moving a hand above it. Pretty straightforward. The nice thing is we actually link this with a wall size display where we see the same information. And what you see here is actually the vertical cut through, uh, through the 3D model of the human body. And obviously we can do exactly the same thing also with a tablet. And then you see naturally um, how uh, the cut lines are actually forming through that human body. And we, we annotate between devices. Why is it important not to touch the table? Think about the surgical environment. Um, everything need, needs to uh, be clean. Uh, you cannot touch computer screens as a surgeon. You need to interact with information that you need in other ways. At the moment, typically, you have somebody sitting beside you to interact with the computer system. However, you could also interact with, with things without touching them uh, by simply uh, moving things around in space. Yeah, so we, we start to look more and more into how can we actually integrate multiple devices to actually solve problems, build over our RT multi-surface systems. However, when you look at a room and you have a screen here, you might have screens in front of you, you might have screens on the sides. There's a lot of space in that room that actually is not a screen. Can we actually use that space in between to actually enhance um, interaction with the data? So we also looked into using uh, an approach that we call projected pixels, where we actually use the space between devices um, to actually show what's actually happening. For example, I'll show you a video in a second where you throw information from the tablet over to a wall display, and you see that information then actually flowing across the floor. All the information, you see it floating across the floor. Or here in a retail space, you walk by and suddenly uh, something that is of interest to you is highlighted. Our phone shows information about that object, you go away, and uh, it, the information disappears. But you can actually use low-end projectors with a spherical mirror to get pixels anywhere in the space. Good. We developed, we started to develop that technology, and then an application partner actually was interested and said, hey, that sound looks cool, that sound looks interesting. Let's actually look into how can we use Jessica-based collaboration and the spatial interacts that I just presented to build an emergency operation center of the future. And then we started to work with them, a small project, another small project, and now we have a three-year project with them. However, the three-year project actually also is in looking into how can we use social media analytics to get situation awareness in emergency situations. How can we analyze Twitter data to actually determine where are problems in, in a space? We are also looking into wearable computing and uh, device-based sensors to get information out to the workers in the field and information from them back into <coughs> the uh, operation center. We want to know if somebody of our guys or girls is in trouble and their heart rate is highly elevated because we might have to send them help. We have the goals. And the last thing is, we also want to look into, can we actually develop these systems in a cloud-based environment so that organizations that usually do not run emergency centers can quickly set one up when needed. You see, we started with some expertise that we have. We are moving on to other areas of research um, that actually are lining up um, with the, the needs of the domain. So then the, ne the next step is actually, how can we transfer this? We still do the work in the university lab. 
Wir kriegen Prototypes, wir kriegen Ideas, wir kriegen Concepts. Also in Calgary or in Canada, universities are not legally allowed to produce products. We cannot sell products to outside parties for two reasons. One, it's really not lining up with our mandate because when you have a product, you need maintenance, you need guarantees, fitness for purpose. All of this is very hard to maintain when you work with students that change every two years. That's the one issue. And the second issue is um, we are also not legally allowed to compete with our industry because the industry can always claim that uh, by using public dollars, we can underbid uh, them because folks are already paid for. Um, so a big chunk of the expense in the order, order, uh, project would not come from the project. So when we talk about plans, uh, one of the issues is IP protection. We talk about patents, trade sequence, or even open sourcing. How can you protect the IP? It might sound strange that you open source something to protect IP. Any idea why this can be seen as IP protection? What is a patent? How much do you know about patent? A patent basically gives the owner of the patent the patent to right, the, the right to make money of that patent without any competition for a certain amount of years. It actually encourages people to come up with ideas because they can make money out of them. The problem with software patents is that usually a product, in a software product incorporates many ideas, not a single one. While in pharmacy, in medicine, you have a drug that cures cancer, the drug is everything that you need to actually uh, have the impact. In software, you often have tons and tons of ideas, hundreds or even thousands of little ideas that together form the product. Um, hence, it's very hard to actually protect software patents. And the other thing is, software patents, there are, there are studies that basically show that the only people that make, make money with software patents are lawyers. Which is actually um, an abomination of patent, uh, of the concept behind patents. So, um, we have a lot of industry partners who say, I do not have the money to protect my patents. I cannot sue Apple and win, but I don't have the money to win the lawsuit. So I'm winning because I'm faster and you know, more innovative than my competition. And I can protect my right to move forward by open sourcing uh, the, the idea. As soon as it's open source, it's in the public domain, anybody can use it, but I have a two year lead because I, I actually have to develop it. That's why open sourcing actually can be seen as IP protection. Um, word of advice, when you work with an industry partner, IT, IP needs to be sorted out at the beginning of the project, not at the end. At the beginning, you don't know if something will come out or not. There's a research system. At the end, you know you might have a winner, and then it's really about who makes the money. So sorting it out at the beginning is much easier. In North America, the typical IP rules. North America, the typical IP rules is that the university keep, keeps the IP completely and uh, grants a license to the partner. And typically, the license will result in fees, you know, specifically in, in software. And uh, for us, IP actually sorted out in the contract at the beginning of the, of the project. Um, how can you actually transfer the results? IP protection is one, and then the license to partner or um, that help in the developing of the IP, or even a third party partner. Um, you could also create startups uh, where the IP actually goes to the startup and, and the prof and the students are involved and they create their own company out. And I realized that this is not legally possible here in the um, The other thing is IP. Uh, is deciding, deciding in the heads of the students. Many of them move to industry and take ideas with them. They might not hit immediately any products, but uh, often um, they will have a long-term impact. And last thing is uh, you can do consultancy work around the IP, uh, around your knowledge. However, I want to point out that if you do consultancy work or if your students do consultancy work, they should be paid consultancy rates, not student rates. And the last thing is, what is the value of IP specifically in the software 
area where you actually have to combine a lot of ideas into a single software program. And uh, very often, profs are really good in overestimating how value, how much value their idea actually uh, has. And then uh, negotiations break down because they don't realize that 90% of the work actually happens after uh, the paper is published. Good. Um, I also want to point out that it's not only about making money. Transferring ideas into practice has a benefit for society. And not, you don't, it's not about only making money, it's about having the impact. And uh, we are big believers into social entrepreneurship ideas where the transfer is actually with, uh, into a company or not for profit that owns the idea and uses the idea for some social good and use entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial thinking to actually uh, create sustainable um, uh, organization around it. So the money that the company is making is invested for social good instead of in, uh, going into bank accounts of the owners. And lastly, you can simply put ideas into the public domain and hope that somebody actually put, uh, uh, takes it up. That's what we do as post with publications. We put ideas into the public domain as soon as they're in a public domain, anybody can use them. However, the uptake is usually extremely limited. There are not many people outside of academia that read academic journals and uh, conference papers. So one of the things what we did, we actually developed that multi-service environments for interactive data above tables, and um, we actually created a startup called Witzwork, where they, uh, one of the products they are developing is a collaborative and interactive uh, platform for group decision making around geospatial data. So I'm involved in that. However, I want to point out I'm not the, the majority owner, nor am I the CEO and president, because that's not my expertise. There are people that are much better in building companies than me. Criteria for success. When can it actually work and how does it actually work? Um, first of all, everybody involved needs to have realistic expectations. And the early conversations with potential partners are really about expectation management. What can the university deliver? Um, how much, how far in the technology readiness level can we go? How quickly can we go there? And what, we, what can we not do? They need to understand, they need to agree with it. That means open and honest communication, which is one of the agile principles. Collaboration requires time commitment from both parties. Uh, we need regular meetings. I stopped doing long distance collaborations because it's very hard to actually collaborate specifically on in a fussy environment like a research environment um, with partners that are very far away. So I, I prefer to have local partners where we can actually have face-to-face -face meetings on a regular basis. I usually require that we have meetings at least every two weeks. Uh, and if uh, possible, even at the week. Just so that we are on the same page. We, and we are following the normal agile approach where we say, this is what we've done, this is what we are planning to do for, uh, until our next meeting, and here are the obstacles that need to be addressed. So it's really about expectation management throughout the whole project and see uh, and discuss focus so that. Um, you're not going back after a year to the partner and say, hmm, I promise you to, to do this. We run into problems two weeks into the project and actually we did that. The partner should not be surprised. They should be in on the decisions about redirecting. You need to agree on success criteria. What does it actually mean that you are successful? And you need to agree on technology readiness levels. That's basically the NASA speak about how far, how close are you to a real world product? From an effectiveness perspective, it's really about building longer term relationships. Um, acquiring a research partner from industry or from government organization is a time consuming process. And if you have to do this over and over and over again, you are becoming a salesman as well. If you want to continue to do research, it's better to have a smaller number of partners with long-term partnerships than a large, large number of partners with uh, uh, only short-term partnerships. 
Um, also, I'm very, very hesitant about short-term outsourcing contracts. If the company thinks they can hire our students for cheap to get something done, um, that is not the right partner. Uh, the risk that a student is not delivering their thesis, which is still their primary goal, uh, is simply too high when this is happening. So, yes, there are benefits of doing some development work with the partner. Uh, however, that needs to be taken care of in the budget. You need to be able to hire undergrad students as interns to actually do development. Things graduate students should focus on their research time. Should be able to focus on their research time. Not all partnerships work. And unfortunately, I haven't found a way to qualify partners before the actually do the work. Um, it, even when it sounds all positive, the real who is in the actual collaboration. That's why I would suggest start a short-term project, make a half-year commitment to do something together. And this is really, um, this is really like a test run. Does the real collaboration work, work out? And if yes, then you can uh, look into longer-term collaborations. It's very hard and very painful for both sides to stay in a, in a relationship that doesn't work. Uh, and you need to continue for them another two years. And uh, the problem is, as a prof, you cannot simply say, I stop, because you made commitments to students to fund them uh, to actually conduct their research for two or four years. So you need the money. And uh, again, funding is required in North America. Graduate students usually are paid. So undergrad students pay tuition. Graduate students also pay tuition. But typically, they are getting funding from the university that is uh, larger than the tuition. Usually they get enough funding to pay the tuition as well as uh, the cost of living. Living as soon. Um, funding is required. Co-funding programs reduce cost, but they in, in, uh, increase timelines because writing the application, getting it approved takes time. Um, in North America and Europe, there are plenty of co-funding opportunities because the governments basically decide we want to have our books engaged in more collaborative research, so they are putting money on the table to actually support that kind of work. But it increases the timelines. Um, and one important thing, flexibility is needed. You're still working on a research project, you do not know what the answers are, so even the, the questions might, might shift over time. The goals might change, because of the inherent research risk, and you need to have the open and honest communications with your partners and the discussions that actually ensure that when you see it shifting, um, they agree and you decide what's the new direction for the project. And also, because we are working in a university environment, you often, you always have to deal with changing teams. If you have a longer term project, you need to expect that you will have different team members over time. By, the, by default, I have a 50% turnover rate in my team per year. Why? A master student stays with me two years, an undergrad student stays with me one year, one and a half year, a PhD student about four years. So on average, I get a 50% change over every, every year. Every company that has a 50% change over per year rate is doomed to fail. You don't want to work in a company with huge amounts of change because every time you lose a team member, you're losing the knowledge and the expertise of that team member. In the university environment, that's our modus operandi. I want to point out that the work that I was describing was is not my work. The only way how we can actually get things done is we actually have a team of students um, that actually are heavily engaged and thriving with the so See their pictures. Uh, the pictures of my current team. I have about 20 people in my team at this point in time. Um, it's going up and down, hopefully down in the future. Um, they do most of the work. I'm only talking about it. <laughs> Good. Joys and challenges. I would say that one of the joys is you're really working with partners and solve real world problems. That can be problems that make money for somebody, that can be problems that uh, are for social good. Um, that have an impact on health of people. It really depends on where, what sparks your interest and what your partner's interests are. But it's really about solving real world problems. 
as a prof, I'm also quite happy that I'm able to provide practical experience to my students. They learn how to interact with industry partners. They learn how to present in front of a, of a group of, of people. Uh, they get a lot of practical experience that is going well beyond what you usually would be getting uh, when you do a graduate degree. In North America, there are plenty of funding opportunities for doing this work. There's a reason why I have 20 people in my team when the average computer science prof in, in Calgary has about three or four. Uh, it's simply there is more money available for that kind of work. And it's also more students interested in that kind of work. It immensely helps me to broaden my horizon. I always am keen on learning new things. By working with new partners, I need to learn more and more things. I learned a lot about oil and gas production recently. I learned a lot about emergency management. I'm not a world expert in either of these things, but I've learned enough to actually talk with people in that space in their language. Challenges, expectation management is the key challenge. Uh, really, the initial conversations are really about getting the expectations on both sides right. There is a lot of development effort in each of these projects because we typically go back a uh, deeper and further than what you would do to write a paper. To write a paper, you basically build, you hack a prototype together, you run a study on that prototype, then you throw out that prototype and you come up with the next idea, write a prototype, run a study, and so on. Um, we want to deliver something that is a little bit more advanced and we do more development work that is purely development. And typically, I do this by having a budget structured in a way that I can hire undergrad students as programmers for doing that work. Which gives them practical experience, a little bit of money offsetting some of the education costs. Challenge is really finding the right partners. I spend a lot of I spend a lot of time in meetings and in networking events to talk to a lot of different people. And it's not in my nature. I'm actually quite shy and I'm not the guy that actually goes out and uh, talks to strange people all the time. So it actually is quite a bit of effort uh, to actually do this, but that's something that you can learn. You also need to realize that the business environment is changing immensely fast, and a partner that was really keen to work with you um, might not be keen three weeks down the road because something in their environment has changed. Sometimes it even happened that the person you talked to and that said, yes, I'm going to sign tomorrow, was not at the company anymore tomorrow. Specifically, when you have economic turmoil and layoffs in industry, um, you, are, you might have to uh, deal with uh, changing conditions and you need to move on. But really what this is about is about having an impact, not only an impact. That's, it's really the important aspect. Uh, of doing problem-driven, application-driven research. Impact outside of the university, not only in academic competitions. Good, I'm running a little bit over time. I apologize for that. Uh, questions. Oh, by the way, this is how snow looks like, and this is probably what I will find when I'm flying back from here to <laughs> Canada uh, on Saturday. <laughs> questions. Uh, how, how is your model of connection with the startups? You mentioned that uh, it, it, it's different from here. Uh, um, how is the, the, the interest of the university preserved with the new startups, or you just give, give it away to the students or the professors? To, um, the, uh, the rule that we have in our group is um, whenever we uh, whenever we make money directly of out of IP that we develop, it's split equally between all people that were involved in developing the IP, depending uh, based on the, the amount of time they actually were involved in it. Having said that, we are not making money, we are not licensing uh, stuff. Um, we, uh, the impact that we are really generating is ideas. Um, having been involved in my own startup, I would never ever use the code developed in the university as a basis for coder. Um, we work with relatively junior developers, really bright people, but not very experienced people. So there is a limit on the, uh, on the code quality. 
for the university people are really good at is creating ideas, concepts, and a proof of, of uh, concept, prototype. It's not our job to actually build sustainable, high-quality code that 